Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Very warm welcome to you on what's a pretty cold night out there. Uh, so very big, first of all, big thank you to you all for coming out on a, on a night like this. Um, your president is on holiday at the moment watching Curling in Canada, so you have his glamorous assistant instead tonight. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here tonight, actually, to be able to welcome Robert to be our speaker, because he must be a very busy man at the moment, uh, and I'm sure you've got some questions waiting for him for the end. But please try to hold them back till the end. Um, but he will take questions at the end, so I'm delighted to welcome Robert. I'm also pleased that he brought his crew training flip charts and put them round the room. <laughs> <laughs> really good, really good. All help accepted. <laughs> so without any more ado, I shall hand over to Robert Morrison of Calmac. So good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for inviting me back. It, it feels like it was a month ago. It was three and a bit years ago that I was here. Um, and what a lot we've gone through in that period of time. I think at that point when I visited you last time, it was about November 2019. I was only in this role about a month into the new role. Um, full of ideas on what we would be doing operationally. And then, you know, things changed radically the start of the following year. And after that, my goodness, what a journey we've been on. So tonight, I think what I'd like to do is, is similar to last time, is just run through a presentation with you. Um, we'll do a bit on who am I and what do we stand for. And I know you're a very learned audience, so you know lots about the company, but I'll run through some of the basics as to what we're here to do in, in terms of the contract that we have. I'll do a bit of reflection on the three years and what we went through with the pandemic. I'll try not to make that too long because we all want to see that as in the past. And then we'll move on to talk about the presence, you know, how we are facing the challenges we are right now. And then at the end, to lift our chins a wee bit, I hope to be able to share with you the future and some of the things that we're looking to see in the coming years, both in terms of new vessels, but also in terms of new infrastructure around our network. So that's a, a general plan. A few slides to get through. As Jim said, happy to take questions um, at the end. And can I also introduce one of my colleagues? I've got Don McKillop here as area manager for the Clyde. Hi, Don. Thanks for coming along tonight. You thought you were coming along as a guest. I did. You might, you, <laughs> you might find you're here for the Q&A. <laughs> so uh, without any further ado, let, let's get kicked off then. And, and as I say, we'll happily take questions at the, at the tail end. OK, thank you. Ooh, now, I need to make sure I can see this. Yeah, there we go. Um, so a little bit about myself, and I will say a little bit. Um, career. Prior to CalMac, I had a long career in BT. I was a manager in BT for many years and um, left BT in 2013 and, and joined CalMac. And since then, I've carried out area managers for the Outer Islands, area manager for Inner and Outer Islands, then head of service delivery North, then head of operations, and then from November 2019 to the present operations director. So I've had a, a varied uh, number of jobs in the nine and a bit years I've worked in CalMac. I should say to you, I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's a tough world right now. You were right in your introduction, Jim. It is a tough place right now. But I love it. I love it. And I never regret the move I made to come to CalMac. Some of that is probably a bit emotional, to be quite honest with you. I, I really like the challenge. And yes, even though it's hard, I like what we do. And I, and I like the part we play in trying to help make this business survive and improve. So that's enough about me. A bit about who the business, is, what the business is and what we stand for. So UK's largest ferry company, um, carrying more than 5.7 million passengers and 1.4 million vehicles annually. 35 vessels serving 28 islands and remote mainland communities across Scotland's west coast. 160,000 sailings over 363 days per year. Iconic and recognised Scottish brand. You only need to show the emblem and the funnel of the vessels, and just about everybody knows what that stands for. And we have around about 1,800 employees. That's a little bit about the business. The ferries contract, a transport franchise. Um, the contract tightly specifies routes, fares, timetables, and vessels. We do not own or procure the ships, as you probably know. Um, we do not own or have direct involvement in the improving of harbour facilities. We've got a say in it, but we don't own it. Uh, and sometimes that's something that 
when we talk to our wider public, we have to try and remind people of. The Lifeline Service, helping island companies to do business for the rest of the world. It, it's a really important piece of what we do. Maximising opportunities for local businesses to tender for contracts, helping create economic regeneration, local employment and population growth, and normalising lives by making it easy to travel. A number of the Western Isles have suffered from island depopulation. It's a concern that they have in just about every community. We've got a key part in trying to maintain the transport link. I think one of the hauliers said to me not that long ago, at the end of the day, what you do, I want you to be like an extension of the road. And I thought that's a really simple way of putting it, but that's what they want. They want us to be an extension of the road so that people can move on and off their islands seamlessly. At times that's very challenging. I, I, I don't mind saying that, but that is an ambition for the island people that we need to work to try and deliver. And normalising lives by making it easy for people to travel. More than just the ferry company, deep roots in the community, huge roots within the community that we serve, and a number of links in there. Understanding and empathy for challenges faced by islands and rural areas. It, it is, you know, I often say this, we have to see ourselves through the eyes of the island communities that we serve. We, we need to appreciate, and when people are concerned, angry, frustrated, when they don't have the service they want, it's understandable. If I lived on an island, I'd probably feel the same way, and we have to see it that way. They've got every right to expect the best that we can give them, and they've got every right to challenge us in that way. It's not always the easiest to manage, from my perspective and my colleagues' perspective, <coughs> but it's perfectly understandable for island people to have these thoughts and expectations. And understanding why ferries are important for social and economic well-being of communities. If we're not able to sustain um, island services, it has a huge impact. I've spoken to shellfish producers that will tell me that if our ferry is even late, uh, you know, I remember phoning one of them up to say that the Hebrides had a fault, it had been repaired, it was running an hour and a half late. And I thought that was a great success. But the answer that came back from the haulier was, well, actually, that doesn't help me. And I thought, well, why not? And the answer was because the shellfish that was leaving from Loch Maddy had to meet with a vehicle in Skye, which met a vehicle in Lanark, which went down to Dover and ended up in Santander in a fish market the next day. So one and a half hours late looked like a success for me. It was absolutely no use to the haulier. The product would be 24 hours older and probably worth half the money it would have been had it got there in the timeline that they expect. So you have to recognise these things and you have to understand we are inextricably linked there and it really is important that we give people everything that we can. So I guess what I'm doing is setting scene here. An economic enabler. Um, some facts here. Fraser of Allender Institute reports that CalMac supports 6,000 uh, jobs in mainland and island communities across the country. In 2022, over 95% of the apprentices um, were recruited from local communities. We usually take on about 20 um, apprentices on the, on the vessels each year, some in deck, some in engine, and some in retail. But 95% of them come from the communities we serve. And it's important to put that back, obviously. Currently, 70% of our employees live across our islands and coastal communities. So these people, when they're off duty, are living in island communities and they're understanding the pressures that people are under. And then one in 50 employees in Oban generally supported by CalMAC, either directly or through wage spending by CalMAC employees. Ah, I did say we would do a little bit of reflecting back. Yeah, when I think back to the last time I spoke to you all, no one could have predicted what was ahead of us. I think I was here with you November 2019 and by January, <coughs> February 2020, we were in the midst of, of a COVID <coughs> crisis. It was really demanding on everybody that worked in CalMAC Ferries. I know it was demanding on the whole population and the, and the whole planet, uh, but we faced some real challenges during that period. And we tested um, our processes and our people to an extreme, uh, an absolute extreme. I do believe that in adversity, you see the best of people. Sometimes you see less than the best, but generally speaking, you find the best in people. And my goodness, during that period, uh, we were tested to that extent. So just to touch on, but not to spend too long on, operate my lifeline service while there is a public health pandemic. The service will face prolonged periods, significant disruption due to staff availability and drop in demand, compounded by the pace of change due to underlying uncertainty. 
So we knew that we had to maintain a service. We knew that we had to, in some respects, we would be placed in a position where we had to try and police the service that we maintained to communities. But it wasn't our job and it wasn't the job of people that worked for CalMAC Ferries to police this. So it was quite compromising. We were working with government guidelines all the time and we were having to try and protect our people at the same time. It took its toll. And to be honest with you, even for some months afterwards, it took its toll on our people. I could see emotional burnout from staff that were in frontline front, front roles. And that's been something that we've had to, to work around. But I think, to be honest with you, um, reflecting back on it, I was really proud of the way that people pulled together and some of the feedback that we got um, towards the end of the pandemic echoed that, that people recognised what we had to do. So the strategy to operate the Lifeline service, revised timetables, much reduced timetables, but ensuring that the key things like fresh food for the islands and fresh products off the islands were prioritised. Yes, a bit of policing over who could travel and who couldn't, and that was difficult for our people at times, uh, because you're trying to show some empathy with people's needs, but also you're having to try and follow closely uh, government requirements. And to communicate early and effectively with all our stakeholders to keep people advised of what was going on. Our management, we stood up crisis management teams, daily structured calls, overview of network status, examining government guidance, which changed a lot of the time and we had to keep realigning to match that. <coughs> validating assumptions, maintaining decisions, and communicating both internally and externally to allow people to know what we were doing. And it wasn't all about you know, trying to get food on and off. Also, I had to be very, very uh, cognizant of the fact that a number of islands were very concerned about the spread of COVID to their communities. So I had to try and protect that as well by making sure that we didn't allow more travel than was necessary. So it was a very much of a, a balance, I would say, to be struck at that time. And looking back on it, there was a lot of learning from that. And what did the customer say? Some of the feedback was very positive towards the end of it. So travel from Stornoway this morning, very immaculate, staff going around cleaning over and over, well done. Amazing service when I was called and had to call back to confirm and change upcoming bookings. Calm, understanding, polite and friendly. All this at the middle of the pandemic when things were really challenging. I won't read them all. You can see them there for yourself. So that was our past over the three years in the blink of an eye, I guess. Um, moving to the present, some numbers, again, some you will be aware of, I'm sure. Um, so UK's largest company, ther ferry company, 35 vessels, 1,800 employees, Scottish brand, scheduled sailings, 164,000, ship passengers, 5.7 million, weather cancellations, 5.9, and tech, 1.3. Customer satisfaction still holding at 86%. Some of our values, people first, locality and bravery. And these have been tested in, in recent months and recent years for sure. Um, but we have quality people that work for the company and we've got people that are heart and soul into what they do. Uh, and it's a, it's a great thing for any business to have. Locality is about being present within the communities that we serve and listening and being brave at times of challenge, like now, where we're dealing with a number of vessels in dock at the same time, not in any way the kind of plan I would like to be running, but we have to be brave and try to plot our way through that and make sure we maintain our services until we see these vessels returning to service. <coughs> Challenges that we face, um, increasing demand driven by success following road equivalent tariff. There is no doubt road equivalent tariff brought in around about 2015 by the Scottish Government was a great enabler. Some of the routes increased the number of passengers they carried by about 40%. But that in itself brought a you know, significant challenge for us as operator because we've done all that with an increase of 30 to 40% people travelling with the same fleet of vessels, inherently with the same fleet of vessels. And that's been really part of the challenge we've faced. Full deployment of all our vessels with no spare vessel to supplement capacity. So if I look at things right now, if we lose a vessel now, we're having to, in many cases, change perhaps four or five different services and the impact will be on perhaps four or five different routes in order to rejig the patch and the, the vessels to maintain a service. That's really difficult because obviously if an island loses a boat, they are upset and concerned. But when you then go to four other communities and say we're going to affect your timetable, because we need to try and rebalance the pack. 
yet upset four or five communities. And that is a world that I'm sure Don will nod his head and say we live within. Um, the average age of the fleet, 24 years. And you can see on the graph there the difference that has made and the lack of new tonnage coming into this uh, service. You know, you can see the years there. It's not very clear there, but where we are now, most of the fleet is, is way beyond the age that we would expect them to operate to. There's a huge impact on that when vessels go into dry dock. Normally, when we do, go through a dry dock season, each vessel would be two to three weeks in dock normally. And what we're finding now is just about all the vessels, but particularly the older ones, they're going into dock. Things are being found that need to be worked on. So emergent steel work on the hull uh, and on tanks on the vessel. And all that is adding to the time. And it's meaning that vessels are sitting far longer in, in dock than would be ideal for us. And it's adding to the pressure. Um, weather patterns, changing weather patterns, it is debated. I know some... Uh, disagree with it, but certainly we we think that we see different wind conditions. And if you look at most of our network, uh, most of our ports would be sheltered from sort of prevailing southwesterly winds. And now we see northerlies and southerlies, unusual wind directions, which expose traditionally sheltered harbours and things, and, and it has an impact on us. And I think that is an impact with uh, global warming and the changes that we're seeing. Lack of standardisation leading to complicated supply chain. It is true if, if all our vessels were similar, similar technology, similar mechanical inside, it would be much easier to maintain them. We're hunting around for parts for some of these vessels. Some of the engine manufacturers no longer make the spares for a number of our vessels, probably about four of our vessels. The engines are no longer supported. If we've got a real technical challenge there, we could be waiting months for parts to be made. So it's a very, very um, difficult challenge. Record levels of investment to improve resilience and reliability. So 67% increase, 34 million pounds was spent on vessel maintenance and that's across dry docking and fleet maintenance throughout the year. Now, five years ago, that was probably about 21 million. So you can understand the difference in any business having to carry that extra cost, 21 million up to, to 34 in a matter of four or five years. And of course, on the horizon, Glen Sanex and 802, and I'm sure you'll want to ask questions on that with a further four Isla design vessels, two for Isla and two for Tarbert Lochmaddy, as well as the small vessel replacement program. And I'll touch on that at the tail end and share with you um, the benefits that that will bring, I hope. I should also say, yes, it will be great to see new vessels arrive. Of course it will be to see six large vessels. But on top of that, there's also the redeployment of the fleet that remain. So two new vessels going on to our Dross and Brodick potentially frees up a Caledonian Isles that has many years still to service. Two new vessels going to Isla, frees up a Finlagen, which is our third oldest, third oldest vessel in our fleet and has many years left in it. And likewise, the Uig Triangle, seeing two vessels up there, would free up the Hebrides. And the Hebrides is you know, a very resilient workhorse around our fleet, along with the Klansmen, in terms of being able to reach far off parts of the network in winter time. They're very resilient vessels. So apart from the new vessels, there's also the knock-on effect of bringing them in that will see our business same. Um, in an improved place. Resilient, high quality service. So a great deal being done quietly in the background, perhaps, and not very obvious to a wider public on things like logistics management, long-term yard strategies, where previously each year, um, yards would tender for the work for the fleet. And this year, the Isle of Lewis might be in the Clyde, and next year it might be in Aberdeen, and the year after it, it could be in Camel Laird. We've worked on a, on a plan there that sees the same yards looking after the same vessels for a longer window so that you have an established plan and they know the vessel they're going to be working with maybe for three to five years. Work that can be planned in advance. They may know what they're going to be doing the following year and the year after. It's definitely going to help us and, it, and it's going to make sure that the yards have, a, have a, a far closer link and a bond to the work that they're doing on our behalf. Condition monitoring and assessment. A great deal being spent on things like vibration analysis on board our vessels. And the idea of that is to try and identify faults before they become service affecting. So picking up vibration might identify bearings that are starting to show wear and could be failures that would cause us a breakdown. So you're doing that proactively uh, and doing that routinely. Uh, technical incident reviews, root cause analysis. When we do have breakdowns, we absolutely have to look at how are we going to learn from this and how are we going to try and make sure that we take the learning in order to improve the reliability for your future. 
and then some other things in there, operational excellence, benchmarking, where the business is looking at how our structure and our management structure could particularly help us manage the fleet better. Improvement activity, um, introduction of asset management technology is simply moving us into the 21st century in terms of things like defect recording on board the vessel. Um, the old ways of carbon paper and uh, you know things being recorded and mailed don't serve the business that we're in right now. So going to an improved technology to help us record where we are with our assets and with any issues that we have. And then the backdrop to that picture, the warehouse centre of excellence um, in a place called Falls Park uh, near Guruk, uh, where we have everything centralised now and organised in a clear and easy way so that we can react quickly. Even when I last year and this year been to the dry docks, what we do now is prepare all that and it's containerized in advance before the vessel goes into dock. So I was at the Lord of the Isles dry docking in Camel Laird about three months ago. And when I arrived down there, the first thing they wanted to show me was a steel container full of all the parts and all the things that were required for the schedule of work. That is a huge step forward from what we had before, where people would be looking for parts just as the vessel was heading to dock. So the warehouse and the central stock management are big improvements for our business. A little bit of a video now on, on dry docking. I'll just hit the next button and let that run. The dry dock process is, for a passenger ship especially, is, uh, is essential, the most important it's two weeks of the year, if you like. Uh, because it's that one time where we have no passengers on board, where we can rip things apart um, and, and replace them for that them overhauled. It's, it's, a, it's very important because when we're on service, we don't have the luxury or the time to, to do these essential jobs, um, which essentially is for the safety of the vessel and the passengers. It's dying. Everybody wants in and uh, everybody's got the same, same uh, goal, which is to try and get as, cram as much work into this two week period, two to three week period, as, as, as we can, and then get the boat back out looking, looking majestic and get, get it back out once we're on. Somebody asked me a question earlier about. Um, you know, in the past, we were able to do more on the vessel in terms of maintenance um, in progress. And one of the reasons that is a problem for us now is we are so busy. Our timetables are stretched to the maximum and most of the fleet is, is working to the full hours of rest that the crew can operate to. There simply isn't the hours for people to do maintenance at the end of a day, apart from on some of the longer crossings. So, for instance, Oban Castleby, where the boat has got five hours on passage, you'll probably find they have more ability to do things like painting and chipping and cleaning and tidying the vessel. But some of the, the rest of the fleet, if you took the, the Hebrides on the Uig Triangle, if the Hebrides overruns by even more than about 30 minutes on a summer timetable day, there isn't enough rest hours for the crew to have the rest and we have to start the next day late. And that's how close to the edge. Now, I think for anybody that's a seafarer, they'll probably agree that hours of rest are meant to be there as a safeguard. It doesn't mean you're meant to push them to the absolute maximum. And that's what we've had to do as we've tried to increase the service without any additional vessels coming along. So we are extremely stretched in that sense. Um, customer journeys, a little bit on that. So service resilience, over the last four years, thereabouts, we've set up an internal operations control centre in Guruk. And that helps us to coordinate when we're faced with these challenges. So when I touched on earlier, the fact that one breakdown might now affect four communities, people are working with tools to try and make sure that we do that as fairly and equivalently as we can. So route prioritization is one of these tools. In the past, if we lost a service, it wouldn't have been uncommon for me to have phone calls from one island and another island saying, well, why, why are we not keeping the two vessels? Why are we giving one up? And this competition would go on. Naturally, if I lived in the islands, as I say, I would take the same view. But what we do now is we use a route prioritization mechanism and, and, a, and a program that allows us to clearly say where the priority has to be for the fleet. And it's more understanding for people when you do that because you're showing that you have a bit of science behind what you're doing rather than them thinking <coughs> you've just taken away one of my boats. That has been a big help. And having the operations control center means that when we are faced with challenges, we can react quickly to that and these people are equipped uh, to actually build recovery plans and to coordinate all the aspects of the recovery that we need. So incident crisis management protocols, uh, probably four years ago I'd have said it'd be good to have, 
by golly, I need it now. These things are, are daily occurrences right now, I'm sad to say. Initiatives to optimise debt utilisation. There's a terrible pressure because of the amount of people that want to travel to get the absolute best we can from deck space. It's far from perfect. I think we put our hand up to that. And there's a lot to do to try and make that better. Making sure that, one, people that are booked turn up. And, and two, every space that we can make available is a space that's available for people to buy and know they've got certainty of travel. And then some communication pillars there to be customer focused, to have a truth well told, to be honest with people about the challenges that we're facing. There's absolutely no value in, in hiding some of the challenges that we're in right now. And I think we are in a better place now by being honest and transparent with our wider public and showing an empathy. It's not easy. It's not easy being in the jobs that myself and Don are in right now. But you've absolutely got to show an empathy for the challenges it's placing on our wider public. I should have a violin out, shouldn't I, really? It sounds... <laughs> However, we'll move it. there will be a cheerful bit, I promise. There will be. Well, here's one, a modern, modern ticketing and reservation system. So we're about to embark on the new ticketing system. 25th of April, the clock is now ticking. Uh, it's been some years in the making. Um, it will modernise what we've had. We've had um, a ticketing system called Compass that's been around since Adam was a boy. It was, um, for those that knew computers in their early days, it's DOS-based. It's green screen with the flashing cursor, like the very first computers had that. It still is that kind of technology. So it's really well overdue, and we're about to introduce it. Uh, and it'll be huge, and it, it'll, be, it'll be considerable for the staff that work for us, but also for the wider public. It'll allow people to do things like online booking, much, much more than they can do now. And it'll allow people to be able to plan their journeys and know that they've got certainty of their, of their travel in advance. It's coming our way 25th of April, Don, I think, yeah? 25th of April, all our people have gone through training. We're now at a stage of revisiting the network to try and make sure that people are familiarized with it. It will be a culture change. For many of our people that have worked in front offices, they've only ever known that one form of computer program, and we're bringing something new to them. So it won't be without its challenge, but we've got to look forward to it because it is a huge step forward. Um, so, yeah, just some numbers in there. It, there's a lot of work going into this, a lot of consultation with the communities as to what people want, and you know, simplified ticketing processes is what we're aiming to do, and advanced visibility to allow people to make their bookings. So even things like some of the, the smaller routes, the slip to slip services, where people would queue up and then get a ticket, you'll have every opportunity to book your ticket online either before you've traveled or even when you arrive at the back of the queue. So if you looked at places like Fishnish, where I know you know, you could be sitting at the end of a queue and you could be buying your ticket and then it's ready and you have it. Um, that's a, a, a big step forward from what we've, what we've had previously. So we're very much looking forward to that. 25th is the date, it's coming our way. I hope you will look forward to it too. Um, empowered and self-confident colleagues. There's a heck of a lot in there. I'm not going to go through it all other than to say, to talk to each of the headlines. Employee journey mapping. Um, one of the things that I've been keen to work on is trying to improve the way that we career path plan for our people. So a lot of people join CalMAC and they spend a long career working in the company. And some of the methods that we had to do things like appraisal needed to be updated and we needed to be honest with people and help them understand what their career pathway would be like so that they could understand what development they would go through and where that would likely take them in the business. We've made a huge step forward on that in the last year, and we've got more to do on that. But I think that's just an honest way to help manage people, to manage their expectations. Employee Assistance Programme came out of the pandemic, really, to be quite honest with you, but we had to introduce an employee assistance program, which basically provides help for people on any matter they might have. That could be job, that could be domestic, it could be family, anything. Um, we saw a lot of people and a lot of stress-related issues after the pandemic. We've still seen a continuation of that. Programs like that provide help to people when they need it. And I'm pleased to see that we have it, and I think it's been successfully adopted and quite well used by our folks. Our people behaviours, just a fresh set of behaviours to make sure that our people understand what we're here to and what we stand for. And then a respect campaign, which is also something that unfortunately has grown with the challenges that we've faced. We suffer, and a lot of our frontline people suffer from abuse, 
And that isn't always just frontline staff, that can be anybody that works in this company. We could be suffering abuse, which is unacceptable. Uh, and all we're asking for there is a respect campaign that means that people that work for this company will be treated with respect. And that doesn't matter who you are in the company, that is all of us, and I mean all of us. And we've done things like on some of the vessels, you'll see posters like that, where it shows, in this case, a master and his, and his partner, and it says everyone at CalMac has a, a crew at home too. So it's trying to humanise the fact that you may be wanting to have a real go at somebody at a counter or on a vessel, but they're human beings and you need to treat them with a degree of respect. A lot in that inclusive CalMac, um, heavily involved in, in trying to make sure that everybody is treated similarly in the, in the business, regardless of who they are, they're treated with respect and, and they're treated evenly. And then final one here, the people behind the journey campaign, which is short videos and I'll show you just a copy of, of one in a moment where people just explain what it is they do for the company. And these things are now going out on the website and for, uh, for wider use, just to show what their day-to-day -day roles are and how they go about their work. I'll run one now. At least I think I'll run one now, if the video runs. There we go. Finger trouble. My name is Joe Govan. Uh, my job title is watchkeeping engineer. I've been 13 to 14 years with Calmac. So my day starts at quarter to six in the morning. I head up to the bridge, I talk to the night man, find out any issues, any alarms we've had over the course of the night. Come downstairs, start the engines up, get everything ready, check the pressures, check, check temperatures, make sure everything's running, make sure that there's no issues. Um, and then I go for my breakfast. <laughs> I got into um, being an engineer uh, through my father, who is a, I am an electrical mechanical engineer. Also, my two grandpas, they were both engineers. So I pretty much grew up with my grandpa telling me stories of being a sea, my dad telling me stories of being an engineer. So yeah, being an engineer is a sort of in my blood. <laughs> Sometimes customers can complain about the, the weather, why aren't we sailing? Now, a lot of the time, we're not sailing and it's for their safety. They're not really going to come onto a boat if the boat is pitching and listing all over the place. They're not going to like it, we don't like it, and it keeps them safe. I love what I love about my job is, I love stripping things down, I love seeing how things work. I love a problem, I love to get my teeth stuck into things. Why it's not working, What's happened? Yeah, and just get my get my hands dirty and my hands in there. If I don't go to bed in the morning, I let somebody down. We're all a team here. Every day is get its own set of challenges that come with it. It's fun, it's frustrating, and it's also exciting. I maybe should say I'm not sure I love him stripping things down as much as he does. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a few less cases of that wouldn't be a bad thing, eh? Um, but all they are, they're videos, we, we've done port staff, we've done vessel crew, and it's to show the human side of people that work for us and show what they're here to do. Um, also probably worth saying, although I've not got a slide in it, that um, at the moment uh, we're, we are working with um, a BBC a company on a documentary about Calmac ferries. And tomorrow actually I'm going to see the next episode. So the company have, have done a number of episodes they're due we hope to go out on bbc in may i've seen the first one i missed the one last week it had to be somewhere else but i'll see the third episode of them tomorrow they are very much human angle they are not a bed of roses they are not showing the finer side of what it's like to work in Calmac. they're showing the tough side um, for instance the first episode that i saw was the broadick games and the caledonian isles broke down in the morning and the pipe band couldn't get to the games, and then the Cali Isles broke down in the afternoon and the pipe band couldn't get home. So it's, it's warts and all, right? So I think, you know, we hope that they'll, they'll go ahead. There'll be at least eight episodes, um, and we, we think that they should, if they're accepted and signed up, go out during May. It's a bit like there's a couple of programs on the TV just now. One's called This Farming Life. I don't know if any of you have seen it. And it's just human stories about people in farms and things. And I find it really captivating. I'm not into farms in any great way, but I find myself when I watch it, I can hardly turn it off. The other one that's similar is there's one inside Central Station, the railway one. I find that the same. You watch it and you end up, you can hardly turn the damn thing off. So 
I'm hoping we're going to see the same um, from the documentary. We haven't got a name for it yet, so you'll have to wait. I don't know what it'll be called, but I hope it'll come out in May and I think it'll show what we're about, warts and all, you could say, warts and all. So, so just to touch on that. And then to move on, um, just to talk briefly, the contract position, we're in year seven of an eight-year contract. Um, and people ask me all the time, what, what's happening there? Are you, is there going to be a CHIFS 3 tendering? Um, could there be a contract extension? Will there be a renewal? Will we retender? Could there even be a direct award? Where we are right now, and all I can say on that is that if we were to be rebidding in the way we, we had to do for CHIFS 2, we probably would have had to start that work maybe about nine months ago. We haven't been asked to do that yet by the government. So I can only say that as things stand right now, the expectation is it will be a contract extension, we think. The difference for us as an operator is that if we are to entertain a contract extension, it needs to be in different terms because the business and the world has moved on. And as I said to you earlier on that slide, maintenance costs that go from 21 million to 34 cannot be something that, a, that an operator can shoulder on their own right. So these discussions are ongoing. I expect an extension is more likely than, than any of these other options at this point in time. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, you know, I, I think that is okay. And if, if it's a contract extension and we, we sort out correct terms to allow us to move forward with the business, it will be an acceptable and a good thing, I hope. Right, I did say I'll try and cheer it up because it's a bit bloody negative, but I want to talk to you a little bit about what's out there. And I'm sorry if you can't see that at the back, but I'll run through them. So 18 new vessels in the next five years. Um, I haven't picked the dates on all these, so you'll, you'll forgive when we talk about Glensanax, for instance. So June 2022, La Frisa in service, Carus returned to Malaga Armadale, which was great to see. And I know we've got Mal residents here tonight, and, but we spoke about the La Frisa earlier. It has been surprisingly effective. It's not brilliant in every sense, but it's done a very good job since its introduction. It's been pretty weather resilient and it's given the mall people in general the commutable service that they'd asked for for many years. In other words, a boat that starts and ends normally at the mall end. May 2023, I'll say it, you can laugh at me later, Glen Sanex enters service. I think we all know that's not likely to happen. We're not quite there yet. So, But we are governed by the updates that we get from the Scottish Government and from Ferguson Yard. So I expect there'll be a further delay announced but the intention when some of these numbers were put together was that the vessel would be arriving in May 2023. February 2024, 802 is planned to enter service. I might say there could be a little bit of an extension on that too, in all honesty. <laughs> However, bear with me, bear with me. March to July 2024, three new Guruk Danun Kilcreggan vessels to be delivered. Um, and that will help us because we've got three different vessels operating in three different ways at the moment to see some standardization there with three vessels the same, passenger only vessels, new technology will, will be a great thing. October 24 to February 25, two new Isla vessels. So that'll be the first two vessels that have been ordered and being built at the moment in Turkey. And I've got a schematic of that that we'll show you in a minute or two. You've maybe seen it already. June 25 to October 25, two new Little Minch vessels. I would call it Uig Triangle. Um, you might too, um, but that's two of the Isla class vessels that would be deployed to Uig Triangle. That will be significant. For many years, we've run the Hebrides on the Uig Triangle, and it has been absolutely maxed out every day in its timetable because it's serving two communities. So it's serving between the two islands all day, and they're right up to their hours of rest. To put two vessels on there will be a huge benefit for both communities and also for us as, a, as an operator. And as I've said earlier, on all these occasions like Isla and the Triangle, we will see a knock-on effect of the Finlagen and the Hebrides able to be deployed somewhere else. Uh, November 25 to March 28, seven new small vessels locations to be confirmed. So that's like the Loch class small ferries, and that's the rollout of seven new ferries. Again, new technology. I think we have a schematic on that I can show you in the upcoming slides. And then somebody asked me earlier, what will be the situation with Le Bois del Malig? There is plans, they're not at drawing stage yet, but there are plans to look at a replacement vessel for Le Bois del Malig service. So that will replace the Lottie on that service, the Lord of the Isles. And then October 2027, 20, new vessel for Mull. 
So that's what's ahead. In some respects, it can't come soon enough for us as operators. We, we really need to see vessels now, but it is a light at the end of the tunnel and, and I'm willing to put, put, put my hopes, if you like, into that. Um, and, and, you know, seeing that difference it would make to, to the operation to our network would be night and day from what we're dealing with right now. It's not all just about ports, uh, about vessels, it's also about port upgrades. And so we've got some in here. So Troon available as the alternative mainland berth. Tarbert terminal building upgraded, that's been done. It's in service, it's great to see. New marshalling area, new office, um, a, a new public area. It's wonderful to see that. Lochmadi Harbour upgrade is taking shape um, at this point in time. Our Drossen services should be transitioned to Troon sometime this summer. Uh, and that's on a temporary basis at this point in time. September 23, Finifer overnight berth completed. I should say to you that I'm nearly 10 years in this company. When I started here in November 2013, my then boss, and I don't think he's here tonight, David Taylor. I don't know if he's here. Is he here? No. David Taylor sent me my first week to a meeting. He said, go to Finifert and go to a meeting at the RNLI station and you'll be talking about the night berth for Iona and for Finifert. That was November 2013 and at that meeting they told me they were shovel ready. All I can say is it must be a big shovel. I'm still waiting and I've got probably one of the biggest risks that we have in our fleet with what's called the bull hole where the vessel has to tie up on a mooring and they decant into a rowing boat or to a small boat to get to shore every night. It would keep you awake to be quite honest when you look at what they have to do to operate. So our expectation is September 2023. I think it's a little ambitious I wish to goodness it's our Guile and Butte Council that have got the work to do, but if they can have it done, a new slip and a night berth at Finifert, it'd be a huge difference and a huge benefit from safety point of view. March 24, Uig Harbour upgraded. Work is ongoing there just now in the first phase. Um, there'll be a second phase further into this year. Danoon Harbour upgrades completed, Colcreggan upgrades completed, and then June 2024, Uig Terminal Buildings upgraded. Now, I should probably say to you that sometimes people... I wouldn't say they complain, but sometimes they, they question why it is that we're doing all these upgrades to harbours. And I think they think it's all because a new boat's coming in. But in some of these occasions, if you look at some of the infrastructure we've got around there, if you take Uig, Uig is probably circa 1960 concrete pier. The work needs to be done regardless of a new vessel coming in. So there's a whole load of work that has to be done there. And it's not all just about bigger boats requiring that. Some of these piers are in poor state. I think Craig Newer's another one concrete in their design and you can quite clearly see they're suffering with their age now so and you know we talk about vessels and we talk about the risk that a vessel breakdown can have there's every bit of significance a risk off a harbour a link span and the likes so we do need to see the infrastructure improvement um for um for the for the network for ports a little bit more uh, port Askig and iona works completed our drossen harbour upgrades should be completed december 24 and Gurak upgrades 26, Gassy, which is La Boisdale, which is the outer harbour with a deep water terminal, Port Ellen marshalling, Craig Newer upgrades completed for October 2027, I think we could look forward to that, and December 2028 Port Ellen terminal building upgraded. There is a heck of a lot in the pipeline, I hope you will agree. Right, a city I would share um, before we go to questions, just what's ahead of us. I don't know if you've seen this yet, uh, if, if so, I'll show you again, New Isla Vessel. This is a schematic, and some of the numbers on the next slide are sort of to be confirmed. But New Isla Vessel class will be next vessels to enter the fleet, expected after the Glen Sanex and Ato 2, with two vessels currently under construction in Turkey. Further two sister ships to follow, intention to operate Sky Triangle. Emphasis on commonality, standardization for future new builds. Isla Vessel, designed with modern take on Hebiles Finlagen, especially in consideration of environmental awareness. Power including battery MGO hybrid arrangement and Voith Snyder propulsion, which is a bit of a change in direction for us, but I'm told by those that know better than me that manoeuvrability will be a big benefit with going with Voith Snyder. <laughs> Some numbers on it, I won't go into them all, but the main thing is length, 94 metres uh, in length. Um, and a lot of glass, which is in keeping probably with new designs that we have now, so a lot of glass. And when you see the artist's impression of the inside, and I think we have it there, quite light and airy because of the fact there's so much window there compared to 
some of our older vessels. So that's what's ahead of us. And we hope, you know, the Turkish yard, I think somebody said to me that in the time that Ferguson's have been building the two in the Clyde for us, the Turkish yard has built and handover something like 30 completed vessels. So with that run rate and with that pace, I hope we see them quite soon. Yep. Other upcoming new vessels. So we've got the design in principle for the, the, the eight lock class replacements. And again, they, they will be, you know, environmentally efficient and battery operated in the main with um, MGO backup, with, with generator backup, but they will be electric. Um, and likewise, Gurak vessels, not to scale, he says at the bottom, quite right, it wouldn't be that big, but the Gurak vessels <coughs> at a very early stage, but also intended to be battery hybrid in their technology, which is just where shipping is going, I guess. That is, I think, a flavour. Um, I think just to touch on now before we go to questions, I'd probably say to you, in, 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 in all honesty, uh, it's a challenging place right now to be in. And to be in this role that I'm in, it's a very challenging place to be. But as I said at the start, um, I've been here nearly nine and a half years now. I have not regretted the move for a single minute. And despite all the challenges that we have right now, day in, day out, and they are many, um, it's a good place to be. And I think if we can see this through and see a recovery and see new vessels coming in and new infrastructure coming in, it'll be a great place to be. So people ask me, can you cope with it right now when there's a lot of pressure on you? Yes, you can. Yes, you can, because you stay optimistic about what the future could bring. And you look at the challenges you have right now uh, and you see your way through that. And that's exactly what we're doing in, in Carmack Ferries at this point in time. That, I think, is about all I've got, Jim. So I think we'll move to the last slide and then maybe, if we can, open up for questions. It's almost unimaginable. I can't think of any other business that has so many moving parts, you yep. know, and a separate company that owns the assets and all that. But at the same time, you're you're not quite nationalised, but you get a huge bung from the Scottish um, government yeah. Yeah, yep. and uh, a whole bloody set of instructions telling you what to do, what your fares are. Yep. Any normal business that was worried that somebody else might get the contract would be very worried about keeping costs under control. Yep. Obviously, there's a limit on the shipboard side what you can do, but, you know, I'm just the one example. I mean, Western Ferries have got this little jewel that they've created. You know, you go down to Largs in the summer and you're sort of falling over Calmac folk. It's just the nature of the business. I'm not criticising, mm. it's just no. an observation. No. But what I'm really wondering in a, in a, in a long-winded kind of way is, do you have any time at all to worry about how much CalMac costs, or are you so, as, as a manager and as an organization, so busy with the provision of service? The government only comes around once in a while to whinge about costs, but they whinge about service. How do you balance that oh, cost versus only, service thing? Only every hour of every day, <laughs> right? Honestly, honestly, I, you know, anybody that's got a social conscience has to, has to consider taxpayers' money and how it's spent. Yes, it's, it's concerning. It is concerning. I think what we've got to do is try and work within the confines that we have right now. You might have heard of the, the project called Project Neptune, where consideration was made as to how do these structures effectively work. So, you know, Calmac Ferries, Caledonian Maritime Assets, um, Transport Scotland. And um, it's an interesting paper when the paper came out. I'll try to maintain my humour here. Uh, uh, somebody asked me, my boss asked me for my thoughts on the Project Neptune paper. I said, it's an interesting book, but the final chapter's missing. Right? So there was a, a whole lot of considerations as to how the business could be realigned and whether CMAL and CalMAC need to exist in separate entities. But the final chapter, which is the decision, has still to be made. So as it stands right now, we, we work with the aspect of the piece of the cake that is ours. And we absolutely have to be financially accountable for that. And it's difficult. Of course it is because we're, you know, the costs are exorbitant. 34 million from 21 million in yard costs over five years is massive. Also, from the pressure point of view, I think it would be fair to say that three, four years ago, we spoke about this earlier, Jim, actually, three, four years ago, um, 
Carmack, were everything, everything that was wrong, it was Caledonia McBrain. Right. Now, um, through some robust discussion and positioning, I think the wider public have a bigger understanding of the part that is Calmac. Rightfully, there is a part. Of course, I'm not going to say we don't have some responsibility there is. But the CML part, the Transport Scotland part, and the Scottish Government part. And that is helpful because I think now the public understand there are other parties at play in here and lack of investment over the last 15, 20 years is a huge part to play. Um, is it perfect? No, it is not. Um, if I think back to last May, I was in Eriskay in a pleasant summer's day waiting for the ferry across the Sound of Barra and there was a guy parked in front of me in a shiny new car and he got out because it was a lovely day so I was standing outside and he came over to me quite abruptly and he said, is that your car? And I said, yep. He said, you're brave, aren't you? Now I always have a little calmac.co.uk <laughs> with a boat and I stick it in my windscreen Usually just so the guys in the boats can see if you're coming on, they know it's probably somebody from the company. He says, you're brave, aren't you? And I said, why? Why do you think I'm brave? I said, I'm proud to work here. Why? He says, these boats of yours in the Clyde. Right? So this was the kind of way the world was then. It wasn't Ferguson's, it was my issue in the Clyde. So I said to him, um, can I ask you what you're doing? He said, yeah, I'm delivering cars. I've got a car business in Stornoway and I deliver cars around the island. I said, that's a lovely car. Well, what is that? It's a Hyundai. Yes, he said it is. I said, can I ask you a question? When do you own that car? I said, you own that car when the wheels are getting built in the factory in South Korea. Don't be so bloody stupid. He said, I own it when I take delivery. And I went, and so do I. Right? So, and, so, and so do I. So Glen Sanex and 802 will be mine when somebody comes up and says, there's the bloody keys. Do you, do you want to take them for a drive? Right? So, so he stopped in his tracks and then he said to me, it just shows you that how fickle life can be, right? He stopped in his tracks. And he said, oh, I never really quite thought about it like that. And actually, he said, I have to say to you, my grandfather worked for McBrain's. You've always been a great company. We've always <laughs> loved you. <laughs> so where do you, where do you go? You know, I think, I think we're in a better place now as a business in being able to defend the part that is ours. And I think there is a better understanding from the public in general. It's not perfect. There's a better understanding of the part that others play in the situation that we find ourselves in. I hope that answers. Hi, Robert. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a mullah, but we we had a business breakfast with Robbie Drummond many many years ago. Yes, and it was a little bit similar to the question you were just asked. It was the the lack of understanding in general of how the three triangles work, yeah. and how do you personally? How frustrated must you be when you are everyone's Calmac bashing? Although that that has seemed to have waned a little bit with the, the documentaries out about yep. the new hulls, yep. but how much frustration or support do you get from Transport Scotland to the greater public, where they understand so uh, anybody travelling for business or pleasure can understand that it's not just a skipper on the ferry, but the problem goes so much higher right up to the top of the Scottish government. It's a tricky thing, Robert. In all honesty, it's a tricky thing. We are Scottish government owned. So obviously they are our masters in that sense. So we have to behave ourselves. But I think a piece of work that Jim and I talked about earlier over the last three years where we tried to reposition that subtly to try and help the wider public understand. Um, I'm not sure that if Transport Scotland were here, they would say they like that because maybe what that means is that actually some of the finger pointing goes to them, not to the master of the vessel. But that is the honest truth, right? So that is where we should be. We went through some of that about three years ago. It wasn't without challenge. Some did not like us standing up and, and being honest with the what is Transport Scotland, what is CML, what is CALMAC. But I totally stand by that because I think if everybody was you know, if everybody shows accountability for that that is theirs, we'll be fine. The problem is if others are not taking accountability for the piece that is theirs, then we have a challenge on our hands. That's where we've been. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was. It's definitely better than it was. Hello. Thank you very much for, for taking the time out of what is obviously a very busy job to come and talk to us, but it's very, been very interesting. My wife is from the Isle of Lewis, and she reads Hebrides News, and she's forward, forwarded this to me. Um, the Loch Seaforth can no longer maintain her previous two and a half hour passage time. The vessel is constantly running, running late due to what Calmac calls 
hull growth buildup. A reference to marine growth or biofouling where barnacles and algae attach to the underside of a ship. Yep. And I'm just a bit surprised that when the ship's cleaned every year that the vessel should get slower every year. Yeah. Um, it's a fair question, but it's been an issue since that vessel came into service. Um, in complete honesty, I would say to you, I think that maybe when the vessel was brought into service, perhaps people were a little bit ambitious and a little bit literal on operation speed and maybe set ourselves a timetable that was going to be hard to deliver on a good day. The vessel has suffered some growth. It's not barnacles. It's like slime on the hull. Now, I'm not a marine expert, but it's like slime. I've seen pictures of it taken by underwater um, robotics, you know, that they put under the hull. Um, and it is building up. But I think, in, in honesty, we've, we've had the hull cleaned. We've had companies in. I think the vessel has had two different coats of anti-fouling in its nine years to try different methods of anti-fouling to see if that will help the problem. My opinion, I think we were too damn challenging on the timetable <coughs> and maybe we're quoting the maximum speed of that vessel. And I think what we should have been is a bit wiser there and left a little bit of wriggle room. It struggles to maintain that timetable, that is a fact. Yes, there is an issue with slime, but I think also we've, we've probably evaded and abetted that issue by setting the goals too tightly. So, so just, just curiosity, thank you for that. Is, the, is that slime unique to that ship? Um, we get it on others. We had it on the Hebrides and they trialled a different kind of coating on there um, for a year or two, but it's more significant on that ship. But the other thing that, and again, we'd need a, a, a marine expert to probably tell us, the other thing that might be a factor with that vessel, of course, is that it's running 24 hours a day. So it's doing double the amount of time that any other vessel's doing when the rest of her fleet tie up. She's running freight. So she's been running nine and a half years, but in all honesty, she's been running 19 years because she's not stopped. So some of that is probably a factor. Um, freshwater locks going into places like Ullapool where there'll be a higher content of fresh water in the loch could be a factor for that slime buildup. But these are all things I've heard. I wish I could say chapter and verse, I know that to be the case. But things like that are probably a factor there in places like um, Ellapool, where you've got a lot of fresh water in that loch. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Slightly tongue-in-cheek, but with a serious underlying point, is your reason for introducing e-tickets to help you with capacity issues on the basis that no, nobody over 60 will be able to travel. No. <laughs> Take a note of that one, Don. <laughs> no. Um, you know, we, as I said earlier, we, we, we're really looking forward to a new ticket and platform. And, and I'm sorry if, it, if it's going to impact on the over 60s, but I'm sure we'll do our very best to help with that too. Um, It'll be a step forward. And, you know, when you, when you see now the fact that people can book online in advance, when my kids go on the bus and go on to CityLink, and I say, I, 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 say I've, I know they're not, but when they, when they say, have, I, I say to them as a, as a worried parent, have you got your tickets, kids? Of course I've got my ticket. It's all on here, Dad, you know? And then they'll walk on the bus and beep, and they're done. You know, there's a different world out there. And we're mucking about with 1970s technology and bits of paper. Um, so yes, we, we do need to see it, but no, we don't want to disadvantage anybody, especially the over 60s, because it's a growth area. They can ask you, Jim, I'm not, I'm not precious. An easy one for you. Oh, thank 1960s you. 1960s technology, <clears throat> my Carmack mug has broken. I can't get a new Carmack mug anywhere. Speak to me <laughs> What's later. What's happened to the merchandise? Speak, speak to me later. <laughs> They're not the real you did, you, hey, you, did, you did pretty well if you've had a mug since 1960. <laughs> you can still get a Waverly one. <laughs> Twice the price, half the thickness. <laughs> Paint wears off it though. <laughs> Mr. Morrison, good evening, and thank you for an absolutely splendid uh, address uh, on thank behalf you. of CAMI. My question concerns uh, quite a newsworthy item just now in the shape of Pentland Ferries Pentalina, mm -hmm. which is being considered by the press at least as a potential um, 
way of assisting CalMAC during its problems. Um, what are your views on the use of a ferry anywhere in the network of this configuration? Mm -hmm. And do you see, personally at least, do you see a future uh, for using catamarans anywhere in the, way, the network, which yeah. would provide advantages not um, uh, available from monohull ships? Yeah. So a couple of things. First off, um, no barriers from CalMAC ferries as to a catamaran design. Um, we don't have any pros or cons in, in that sense. And the whole Pentland question was explored a year ago. There were some issues from Pentland ferries. In fact, we were happy to look at a, a charter at that point, a sort of bareboat charter, but Pentland ferries pulled back from that for their own reasons, which are for them to, uh, to discuss. But what I can say to you is that where we are right now, any tonnage whatsoever would be a huge help for us to run the operation, right? So um, beggars can't be choosers, you may, you may say, but um, discussions are ongoing with Pentland Ferries right now on a form of a charter of a vessel from Pentland Ferries. I think in the coming days that will become clear. I'd like to tell you more than that tonight, but I can't. Um, but I do think something is likely to take place there in terms of a charter from Pentland Ferries. And if that serves us, providing that whatever they charter to us can provide a reasonable service or a reasonable resilience, because that's what it might be, it might be a resilience for any breakdowns to be able to deploy, then I'd be glad of it. I'm quite sure my colleague here will equal, equally agree. We're stretched to the bloody max right now, if I'm totally honest with you. Anything like that would be a bonus. So I think if you give it a week and watch the, watch the press, something might be announced on Pentland Ferries. And, I know, and just to, on your other point, you know, uh, sometimes people have had, uh, have had doubts that Carmack Ferry would not support a, a catamaran. I have no, no concern about that. I think any vessel that's up for consideration, if it can do a job for us and serve the network that we need, I personally wouldn't have an argument against it. Thanks. Good evening. You mentioned that the four ferries building in Turkey, are they all voice neither? I'd heard two of them are conventional. Uh, as far as I know, they'll be the same design. You know, we're looking for universality in, in design. I was at a naval architectural <coughs> meeting on Monday and someone asked the question. They thought two were conventional and I, two were I, voice I, neither. I, I, and why voice neither when they're more expensive, less efficient, well, heavier. I yeah, I think, uh, and again, I'm not an expert on that, so it'd be difficult to comment, but one of the things that has been said to me is that manoeuvrability is, is, is wonderful with Voice Snyder. So, um, look, I'll, t I'll take anything, to be quite honest. But, but I, my understanding is there'll be four of a similar type, and I think, you know, having a similar design for the future gives you the economies of scale when you're purchasing, if, you, if they're all the same here. As we've done in the past, we've built individual vessels and then changed the design every two years. There's no economy for a yard in, in, in that. So the likes of this arrangement, if they are four vessels of a similar design, I think that will make it more attractive in terms of pricing uh, for, for us and for the Scottish government. Um, and I hope, although it remains to be seen, I hope that we've got more fortune in terms of the turnaround time and the building time in Turkey. Okay. Can I ask the, the experts in the room, with the streaker's voice Schneider? Yes. 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 And, <laughs> and some of the some of the smaller vessels are voice Schneider, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to ask you, uh, who who designed the propulsion systems for the two Ferguson ships, and what what is the problems with that with that ship? Is it propulsion and fueling? You know, where where does the problems lie with that ship? I, I couldn't say to you exactly who was involved in the design there, but probably my opening slides, slide said we operate the boats, we don't design the boats. So as things currently are right now, a lot of that is probably coming through CMAL. CalMAC have got a, a point in there. We can't sit back and say we're not involved in it. We must have had some discussion around that. Um, there are, I think there are a number of issues with the vessel. It is taking shape. There's a lot said in the press about the LNG and some parts that are missing for the LNG. But in all honesty, I think there are other things that are, are probably concerning. All the parts that were ordered for the, for the vessel have been sitting in warehouses for five years. Warranty. I, I think somebody said to me recently the engines are due their five-year check. 
I mean, when you think of it like that, there, there's bound to be challenges. There's because bound to be challenges. I, I have overheard that the Transformers, the, the Transformer rooms were recited after all the cabling was running. It, stuff like that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I, I think that, you know, if you watch the disclosure thing, it, it was pretty clear that things were done in certain aspects were done perhaps at a bit of a rush and maybe things were, were moved in order to look good quicker, um, but it doesn't look like it's been done in a foolproof way. And as a result of that, we now suffer the delays. But as to who was responsible for the decisions, I, I, I don't know. It probably predates me even. Uh, I mean, I used to work subcontracted down in Fergus Nielsa and they had offices and offices of engineers, draftsmen, etc. And you look at the place now and you wonder, you know, what went wrong? It's a tragedy in that sense, you know. The principle of building ships in Scotland, who wouldn't have been for that? Everybody would have been for it, but as an operator, I have to be a little bit selfish and say, you know, despite that, we needed them. And we needed them five years ago. And we've taken a lot of heart and a lot of pain and still are because of that. So somewhat selfishly, whilst I sympathise with the principle of building ships in Scotland, we need ships uh, and, and they need to be here. Frankly, they need to be here. Thank you. The last time you were here, you sort of promised me that you would never scrap the Hebridean Isles, my favourite ships. <gasps> <Am I? laughs> I don't remember any promises being made. So, was that afterwards I, in the bar up the street? Or? Oh, right, I, okay, I'm very me. disappointed. None of the newbies look like the Hebridean Isles, but I'm hoping that once you're up to run all your new ships, you let, us one, you let us as a club have one of the older ones for a charter. There you go, eh? There's a thought. <laughs> we were talking about charter earlier. Yeah. I, 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 know, I know that that's something that you very much like to do, your organisation, and this year might be a bit tricky. I know we were talking about it earlier about the Karusk, but the pressure we're under probably means that the Karusk is, is going to be pressed into service with the MCA's approval yes. a little bit earlier than would have been the case. That might not help for your, for your plan, um, but if we can help, I, I've given my contact to Andrew and others, and if I, if I can be a help to try and help some of these things happen for you in the future, I'd like to do so. I'd like to do so. Could Could I just <laughs> Can I come back to the point Maybe. of the uh, <laughs> cost to the public and your new ticketing system? Uh -huh. As far as I know, for half a century, there's been no tickets issued at Cumbria Slip. And now I hear that you're hiring eight new staff to police the slipway at Cumbria at Millport. Why? Well, the reason that we're actually doing that, a lot of that came from the Cumbria community who were concerned about people being able to buy a ticket. I think at the moment, and Don might come in here as area manager Clyde, a lot of the tickets are bought from the large side, so they buy a return. Um, with a new ticketing system, it'll be a single ticket, and so therefore people will be expected to either buy or book their own ticket at home. The Cymru community have expressed a concern that people might not be able to do that, and what we've agreed to do is staff up the Cymru side. Not permanently, but staff up the Cymru side with people to try, with staff to try and help facilitate that changeover and help to try and facilitate people getting used to the new ticketing platform. So there will be a little porter cabin put at the slip, uh, and there will be staff for the summer, and probably beyond that. But we have to look at it, and we have to expect, because one of the biggest things that will come out of this new ticketing system is what they call channel shift, where we expect people to move from um, over-the-counter transactions to online booking. Um, it's not alien. I touched on CityLink earlier. Go and try and find a CityLink office to buy a ticket. There aren't any people buy their tickets online. So we've got that journey to go through. And in some places, and Cymru is one, I think we're trying to do right by the community to make sure that the thing beds in. And that's the reason we've got some people. But that might not be a permanent thing. That might be a thing to help introduce. Don, do you want to add anything there? Because I know you're involved in that. Is that OK, Jim? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. It's just in, um, in regard to Cumbria, the it is, as Robert mentions, it's, it's a temporary um, um, deployment of staff. The Cumbria is our busiest route in the whole network by, if you measure by foot packs, it is, it's exceptionally busy. So with the introduction of e-booking, um, and whilst we monitor the, the, in, the uptake uh, using smartphones, as Robert um, illustrated earlier, and we know that that will occur, we know that a certain component of the the, the, our customers and communities will still go to the ticket office, will still call the call centre. And that's absolutely fine because we need to have these uh, abilities to, to, to sell tickets for those that prefer a certain way and that will continue. But this is only a temporary solution. 
uh, just to recognising how busy um, Cumbria is, recognising the feedback from the community, and it is temporary. There's no permanent staff being employed for that. The rumour mill, eh? The rumor oh, mill. that's OK. That's understandable. Right. I think it's probably time to draw it to a close. Uh, so, thank you, Robert. That was been a pleasure. Thank you for doing the question and answers. Thank you for everybody for coming along and asking the questions. Please all join me in giving Robert our usual warm. Can I say a word or two? Can, can I maybe just thank you all very much um, and, and say to you that I think three and a bit years ago when I, when I, when I last saw you, you said to me afterwards, what, I can't remember what the phrase was you used, you said something like, he's one of us, right? And, <laughs> and, I, and I was really glad to read that afterwards, right? And I think just to say to you that there's, people, can, people can do a job because they just they want the job and other people can do it because it's in their heart somewhere. And I, and I genuinely mean it when I say it. I think that you know, the job I have is in my heart. It's probably from when I've been that age and we were talking earlier about as a boy on the old King George when I, when I was that age. And it is a bit in my heart, right? I so, <laughs> <laughs> but it is in my heart, and you know, I think the assurance I'd hope to give to you all is that there are a number of people. I'm not alone in that sense. Loads of people that work for Calma feel that about it, and that's a great thing. And we're going through troubled times and stormy waters right now. But I think that difference when people have it in their heart will mean they'll do their absolute damnedest to see that light at the end of the tunnel delivered and things improved. So. Thank you again very much, and thanks for all your questions. Just before you all rush off, um, just remember the next meeting is our AGM. And it's here, as usual, when it's on the 19th of April, so it's on the third Wednesday of the month, which is traditional for our AGM, but it's, it is that slightly bit later in the month. So the AGM, that's our next meeting, is here on the 19th of April. Thanks everybody again for coming out. Thank you.